Amen. Well, church, Pastor Dave is not feeling well this morning. And for those of you who, are, uh, who keep a list of a prayer list, as I have been encouraging to do for so many years, please add Pastor Dave to the top of your list. Uh, and Pastor Reggie, uh, some of you may know this, he's in quarantine right now. Uh, he has a procedure coming up, and part of the uh, planning for that procedure required him to get a COVID test, and right after the COVID test, he had to go into quarantine. Um, so you have me for this morning. <laughs> All righty. Well, uh, I don't know if how many of you have been keeping up with the Wednesday night studies, uh, but I've uh, taught the last two Wednesdays here. And we've been looking at the life of Jesus Christ, but we did something unusual. We started from the very beginning, uh, from when he was uh, conceived in the womb. And we, cons- we spent a considerable amount of time, believe it or not, looking at his adolescent years. Yes, the Bible has a lot to say about his adolescent years if you just know where to look to find it. But it's there. And we spent a considerable amount of time looking at the years that he spent as an adolescent living up in Judea. And it was not a pretty picture. Contrary to popular belief, Christ Jesus was not raised in this environment where everyone was holy unto the Lord. There was some contentions in his home, some contentions with his brothers. And there was this, this label that he had to grow up with, being labeled as the son of a whore. That's what the Romans authority and the Jews thought of Mary. He was labeled that. He was labeled an illegitimate son. An illegitimate, he was raised under those conditions with that reputation. So it wasn't a very pretty childhood for him. And then we went into the greatest man to ever live. Who was that? John the Baptist, absolutely. Jesus said that. Jesus said that the greatest man ever born to woman was John the Baptist. But then he went on to say something extraordinary. He says, but yet he who was born in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. Church, that's you and I. That's those of us who've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, who are now citizens of his kingdom. We, you and I, are greater than John the Baptist. I have a question for you, church. Why? Why is it we're greater than John the Baptist? The answer is simple. John the Baptist himself was born under the law. He did not partake of the blood shedding of Jesus Christ. He did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's you and I. Those of us who have been joined to the body of Jesus Christ. Oh, how precious you are in the sight of God. How unique you are. Do you know what the Bible says about you? That one day you will judge Israel. Think of how unique that is. One day, you will judge angels. You will rule with Christ Jesus. As kings and priests, that's the promise. So we looked at John the Baptist. Now we're going to take a look at the early years of Jesus' ministry. And I think that's very fitting for us to have that lesson today. As this is the first Sunday of the year, the first worship service we're having for the year, the start of the year. I think it's fitting that we should look at the start of Christ Jesus' ministry. Well, it's commonly believed that Jesus started his ministry at the age of 30, and I think there's very little dispute about that. Uh, At that time, his earthly father, Joseph, was already dead. We don't know exactly when Joseph died, but we know that Joseph was at least alive at the time Christ Jesus was 12 years old. Because when he went into the temple at age 12, his mother and father came looking for him. And it specifies it was Joseph and Mary. So we know he was, uh, he was alive at least when Christ Jesus was 12. By the time Christ Jesus is 30, Joseph is now dead. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 3. The Gospel according to Matthew. We're going to begin reading at verse number 1.
I think most of us know that Matthew actually has a secondary name in Holy Scripture. He's also known as Levi. And he was a tax collector. And I think we all know how the Jews felt about tax collectors. But nevertheless, Jesus saw it fit to call this man to be one of his disciples. Not only was he one of Jesus' disciples, but he went on to write one of the Gospels. Matthew chapter 3, let's begin with verse number 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Stop here. Church, there is so much to be said about this one verse. But first notice that John was preaching where? In the wilderness. Not in the city, not in Jerusalem, in the wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In fact, John was very familiar with the wilderness. Because we've learned a few weeks ago that he was raised in the wilderness. There are some significant events that took place in the wilderness of Judea. John's father, Zacharias, was told by none other than Gabriel, the angel, that his son, John the Baptist, would, and I quote, will be great in the sight of the Lord and that he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Remember that, church. That, that little fact will come in handy when you continue your studies regarding John the Baptist. It says that he will come in the spirit and in the power of John the Bapt- of Elijah. I mention that because later on, the Jews are going to ask Jesus uh, about John the Baptist. Actually, his disciples asked Jesus about John the Baptist, and Jesus will say that Elijah, that John the Baptist was Elijah, Elijah who had come. But then earlier, John the Baptist will say, I am not Elijah. And if you want to understand that apparent contradiction, go check out last week's message on Wednesday. It's explained in great details. But here, it says that he will come in the spirit and in the power of John the Baptist, rather, uh, of Elijah. Then he says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, that was John the Baptist. But the scriptures went on to say that he was raised in the wilderness and that his mission was to, quote, make ready a people prepared for the Lord, close quote. That was done in the wilderness, church. Now, when we hear the word wilderness, now we think of an area of woods and wild animals. And that does indeed fit the description of wilderness. But the word for wilderness is used in the Holy Scripture in a much broader sense than we typically will use the word wilderness. The word wilderness, that's strong reference number 2048, and it means loathsome. It means a desert. It means a desolate place, a place of solitude. So when you start to put these pieces together, you get the picture that's being painted. It means really isolation, a place to be alone. Now we start to understand more about the references of Christ Jesus escaping to the wilderness to pray. Quite often he would do that, but there's a lot more. God sent the children of Israel into the wilderness for 40 years and, uh, because of their sins. But while they were there in the wilderness, was there enough food and water? No. But God provided food and water. Think about that. That's the wilderness. There wasn't anything to eat. Jesus uh, provided water from a rock, we learned. God supplied it, their food. He supplied their water. He supplied their protection. He stood before them as a pillar of light by night and a pillar of cloud by day. So not only did he provide food and water, he provided protection. For those who know Yahweh Elohim, the great I Am, 
the wilderness was a place where you relied on the provisions provided by God. These provisions you needed for your daily survival. The wilderness is where the Messiah, Christ Jesus, would be born. I know we all know that he was born in a manger, but the prophecy found in Revelation chapter 12 tells us a little something different. Actually, what it does is it expounds on what we know about Jesus being born in a manger. And I think it's in our best interest, church, if we take a look at that. Go ahead and turn to Revelation. Keep the place in where you are in Matthew. Go to Revelation chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 1. Revelation chapter 12. Before we even get into the verse, the first thing I want us all to notice, just because I want us to be aware of these things, is that the word revelation is singular, not plural. I cringe every time I hear someone say, say revelations. It's a single, single revelation. It is the unveiling, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a single revelation. Verse 1, now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Let's stop here, church. Let me ask you a question. Who is this being described? Does anybody know? Call out the answer. Who is this woman? Israel. Israel. Thank you. Who said that? Thank you. I can't tell you how many times people responded to church. The church. No, this is not the church. If this is the church, she's in trouble because she's pregnant. Yeah, right? And the church is always described as what? A virgin to Christ. But let's go on. Then being with child, she cried out with a lot in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Stop here. Who is this? Yeah, we all know that one. Isn't it interesting how quickly we can identify Satan, but not Christ? Yeah, it's kind of scary, actually. But let's go on. Verse 4. He, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Let me stop there. You ever heard the expression that a third of heaven was cast out of heaven? A third of, rather, Satan, the uh, demon? Let me get this straight. <laughs> the angels were cast out. That's where that comes from, from this verse right here. These stars apparently represent angels who were cast out of heaven at this time of this, um, this event. But let's go on. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up. By the way, that word there is the same word that's used regarding the snatching up, the hapatso, what is also known as the rapture. Okay, was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. All right, let's stop there. All right, I'm not going to get too much into the 1,260 days, but if you were to do the math, it comes out to be three and a half years, interesting enough. But this woman here, who was described earlier as being clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and had a head of garments of 12 stars. That's actually explained in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph, that's the son of Jacob, has a dream involving the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him. And it was Jacob, that's Joseph's father, who actually interprets that dream for us and it recognizes that this is describing the birth of Israel. So indeed, this woman represents Israel. Notice in verse 6, though, that the woman is being fed by the Lord himself. God is feeding this woman. Where is God feeding this woman? In the wilderness, right? A place where the woman has no choice but to trust and to rely on the faithfulness of God. Now, I want you to skip over verses 7 through 12 at this time, and I want to take a look at... Verse 13, we'll get back to verses 7 through 12 at a later time. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, 
He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Let's stop there, church. Where is this woman now? Still in the wilderness. She went from one wilderness to another. What's happening to her? She's being nourished. Who's nourishing her? God Almighty, Yahweh Elohim. That phrase, time, times, and half of time, notice the first one, time, is singular. The second one, times, is a plural or a dual. And the third one is half a time. That's another way of saying what? Three and a half years. How interesting. How interesting. But this woman is being protected by Yahweh Elohim in verse 14. She's taken into the wilderness, and the Lord is nourishing her. It is God who is doing that. Church, for us today, our wilderness is a place of solitude. It's a place where we can go to be alone. It's a place for us to commune with the Father, to hear from him, to be nourished by him. It's a place where we can confront our, evils, our evil desires, our sins, the things we harbor in our hearts, and we give them to the Lord. Our wilderness, church, is our time alone with the Lord to meditate on his word. This is where we encounter the living God. The wilderness is where we go through our transfiguration with our encounter with the living God. Allow me to show you something very interesting, something that a lot of people miss. Please turn to Luke chapter 4. When I was studying this some years ago, I wanted to look to see if I can find any commentary or scholars that picked up on this. And quite surprising, I have yet to this day. But I want to show you something that I find extremely interesting. Luke chapter 4, and we'll begin reading at verse 16. This is, again, the start of Jesus' ministry. And it's a Sabbath day. It's a Saturday. And he walks into the synagogue. And we're going to pick up the story there. Verse 16. As he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he had opened the book. He, he found the place where it was written. All right, stop there. For those of you who don't mind writing in your Bibles, you might want to underline that word found because that tells us he was searching for a specific spot that he wanted to read. He found where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, in recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says, he closed the book and gave it back to the attendants and he sat down. And then all the eyes of, of those who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So they all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words in which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? They marveled. They were amazed. They were pleased. <laughs> but that was short-lived. Let's go on. Verse 23, he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we hear, we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many leopards were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, 
and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with great joy. No. What were they filled with? Wrath, rage. They went from, oh, this is good stuff, to having rage and wrath. They were filled with great wrath. Okay, verse 29. They rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to, th to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Oh, my. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. They wanted to kill him. Okay, church, stop here. What was it that Jesus said that was so upsetting? Well, let's look at what he said, all right? He's giving this quote. Well, it wasn't the quote from Isaiah because that is what they really liked. They embraced that part. It's what he said after that quote from Isaiah. Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Verse 25. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath. Stop there, because we may miss the point here. Zarephath was Gentile. Okay, let's go on. Verse 27, and many leopards were in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. Whoa, stop there. Guess what? Naaman is also Gentile. So what is Jesus pointing out here? God performed these miracles for these Gentiles and not the Jews. Yeah, how do you think that made them feel? Like grabbing him and throwing him off a cliff. Yeah. But that's not the point I want us to take a look at, actually. I want us to focus on what did God have Elijah and Elijah do with these individuals? I want us, because Jesus is pointing this out. He's highlighting this, which when you see something like, like that, that's like a arrows pointing down, red lights flashing, alarms going off saying, study this, this is important. Jesus is highlighting this. So what do we see going on? Well, if you look at the first account as found in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah fed a Gentile woman, and he also resurrected her son from the dead. This is who God sent Elijah to. No one else in Israel during this time, this time of turmoil, he sent this prophet to this Gentile woman who was starving. She was preparing her last meal for her and her son. Her son died. Elijah fed them and brought her son back to life. When you consider that miracle, what was going on in this woman's home and Christ Jesus pointing us to look at that, it starts to paint a picture of what he was also saying. Take a look at the next account. 2 Kings chapter 5, Elijah's successor, a guy by the name of Elijah. What did he do? He cleansed a man with, who had leprosy. Okay? Now let's consider the totality of what is going on here. Why these three miracles? Christ Jesus could have selected anything from, from the entire, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. But he specifically selected these two. Ask yourself why. What was it that's so unique about this that he wanted us to know today in the year 2021? The answer could be found by looking at the significance of these three miracles and their fulfillment in Christ Jesus. To give the dead life, the cleansing of all unrighteousness, the feeding of our spirits. All three happened there. They were fed, the debt was raised, the dirty was cleansed. That's a description of what you and I have gone through. We were dead before the Lord. In fact, the scripture says, while we were yet still dead before the Lord, he gave us his son. 
We were then cleansed of all unrighteousness. That is what allows us to stand before a holy and just God. Not our righteousness, but we've been cleansed from our righteousness, and we are now robed, we're covered in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And then he gave us this. His holy words, we feed on this. This is what we feed on. That's what is being described right here in the text. I find that amazing. That, that's just incredible. You know, th that is what irritated the Jews. But for all of us in this room, it should humble us. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, let's pick it up at verse number 1 again, just to keep the context together. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Now John himself was clothed in camels here, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Stop there. This sounds like a pretty wild guy. Yeah. But many scholars believe that the leather belt that he was wearing was the leather belt that Elijah actually wore. But let's go on. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who wants you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. Close quote. This was a powerful man. He confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees before Christ Jesus did. He got in their face. He was not afraid to proclaim the word of God. In fact, he told the king that, the, it was un, that he could not have married his wife and that his wife was, was illegitimate. That's what got him thrown in prison. That's what got him beheaded. But he wasn't afraid. That's John the Baptist. Wow. Verse 8 is interesting. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Now, the New American Standard Bible reads, therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Now, this passage here, church, is describing fruit that is produced from repenting of sins. For the believer in Christ Jesus, that fruit is what flows out of the heart. Christ Jesus said that what goes into a man is not what defiles him, is what comes out of him, is that what defiles him. But for the born-again Christian, for you and I, church, we are filled with God's Holy Spirit. That was the promise. We, were fit, we are filled with His Spirit. This is what flows out of the heart of the Christian, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is one fruit. It's love. What love encompasses is everything that follows in Galatians chapter 5. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That is who you are. Or at least that is who you're supposed to be. When Jesus says you will know them by their fruits, that's what he's talking about, what comes out of the individual. I often tell people that Christians really, we wear everything on our sleeves. And we should. Our lives should be transparent. And what flows from us is the fruit of the Spirit that everyone can see. Wow. Verse 10. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the, of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's not there. You know what, church? Christ Jesus said something very similar in John chapter 15. And I think it's in our best interest for our spiritual growth to take a closer look at it. Go ahead and turn to John chapter 15, please. Verse 
We'll begin reading at verse number one. John 15, verse 1, Christ Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Stop there. You realize every time you read his word and allows his word to speak to you, it cleanses you from all unrighteousness. The Bible says also that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to not only forgive us of our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's incredible. Thank you, Lord. I need that. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. That's exactly what John the Baptist was saying. But here Christ Jesus is reiterating it. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Stop there, church. By this my Father is glorified. You want to glorify your Father in heaven? Bear fruit. It says it right there in the text. By this, my Father is glorified. So by default, if we are not bearing fruit, we're doing the opposite. We're bringing dishonor to our Father in heaven. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Then he goes on to say, so you will be my disciples. He connects bearing fruit with being his disciples. There is so much to be said about that in Holy Scripture. There is passage after passage that describes that his people are the ones who are producing fruit. And there are so many passages that describe if the branch is not producing fruit, it's cut off and thrown into the fire. He said it so many different ways so that we don't miss it. Look at verse 9. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. We all know what that means, right, to abide. That just means to remain, to stay there. But where is he telling us to remain and to stay? In his word. That's how we remain connected to the Father. Is it me or has anyone else, you know, ever spent a time when you didn't pray as much? And what happened to you? When that disconnection is there, you find yourself drifting away and suddenly you're doing things like, man, I can't believe I did that. Yeah, that's why it's so important for us to stay connected to the word of God. Because we will continuously bear that fruit. But once we have that separation, there'll be no fruit. And before you know it, you are totally distant from the Father. Asking yourself, how did I get here? Let's go on. Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you that your, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Stop there for a second, church. Did Jesus say this is my suggestion? It's a commandment. A commandment, church. A commandment that he that we love one another and so that we don't run the risk of missing what he's saying he qualifies that as I have loved you well how did Christ Jesus love you he loved you so much he died for you and he's asking us to love the same way I have a question for you church I asked this question on the Wednesday at the Wednesday Wednesday service I'm going to ask you right now Evaluate your love right now. Do you have a biased love? Evaluate that in the privacy of your own heart. Can you honestly say, I love everyone the same way that Jesus loves me? And if you cannot say that, and there's some of us here who really can't, repent of that. Ask the Lord for help, for strength. Because he says right here in the text, 
that I have a new commandment for you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Let's go on. Verse 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his ma master is doing, but I have called you friends. Oh, thank you, Jesus. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I have chosen you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. There's that term again. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Wait a minute. Here he's tying in bearing fruit to answers to your prayer. Well, maybe some of the times when the Lord didn't answer my prayer, that's because I wasn't bearing any fruit. Yeah, this is that important to the Lord. Let's go on. Verse 17. These things I commanded you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Stop there. You have heard me preach time and time again on that one, that we are not from this world. So please, church, stop acting like you are of this world, because that's not us. We are not of this world. We don't behave the way the world does. Our standards are higher standards than what the world follows. We don't respond to situations like the world responds. I was talking to this guy one time. Uh, he wasn't a Christian. And he was telling me that he didn't see the difference between a Mormon and a person who was really in the church of Jesus Christ. That broke my heart. And I know he was telling the truth. Where he couldn't, he couldn't see the distinction between someone who was in a Christian cult and someone who claimed to be in the body of Christ. If we are truly living by the standards of Jesus Christ, everyone would know. Everyone would know. Let's go on. Where am I? Verse 17? Somebody tell me, where am I? Thank you. These things I've commanded you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that the world hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of this world, because the world hates you. Remember the, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. If they, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all th these things they, they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know who sent me. Let me stop there. This is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ telling us not only what we can expect to happen, but how to handle it. Church, if you can go through your entire Christian career without experiencing any persecution, I doubt seriously if you are sheep. His sheep are going to experience trials and tribulations. That was promised. But Jesus says, but woe to the man that brings it. That was a promise. We need to be prepared for that. Especially as we're going forward, church, trust me, church, we need to be prepared for that. Let's go on. Verse 24. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in the law. They hated me without cause. Verse 26. But when the helper comes, who's that? Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you. When the helper comes, who I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. All right, church, let's stop here. Go back to verse 11 in Matthew, chap in Matthew chapter 4. I think we are. 3? Three? 3. Okay, thank you. Verse 11. And I want you to see something here. Again, this is John the Baptist speaking. And he says, this is uh, right before he would baptize our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water 
unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is greater than me, than, than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willowing fan is, is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire unquenchable fire. Church, there are so many metaphors used in describing the judgment of the awesome and true God. In this passage, John the Baptist uses wheat and chaff from, as being the, 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 the judgment that God is doing. The wheat is being saved, the chaff is being burned. The wheat represents his people, the chaff represents everyone outside the body of Christ. Go on, uh, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan and to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so for thus is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Okay, church, stop here. This is the second recorded words of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. The first recorded words is when he was 12 years old. When he was 12 years old, he said to his mother and father, you know, didn't you know it must be about my father's business? The second recorded word here is he's saying, permit it to be so, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Verse 16, and when he'd been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lightning upon him, he says, and alighting upon him. That's in the New King James. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Church, please make note what happened to Jesus Christ immediately after his baptism. Go to chapter 4 and look at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. That's when the tempter came to him. I'm going to stop right there. That's when the tempter came to him. Church, I want us to really recognize that the devil is real. And I am afraid that many of us, we have lost touch of that to the point where we can no longer identify the footprints of Satan. Every now and then I get sent an article regarding something bizarre happening, and most of it I can dismiss. But one time, a few years ago, I was sent an article, someone asked me to check it out, and I was really blown away by it. And I want to share a snippet of this article with you, just for your education. This uh, article appeared in several news outlets. Uh, it was reported in the, the Sun magazine, as well as USA Today. Uh, it's about uh, an account of a, a, a demonic possession. And what made this story interesting wasn't the fact that it's about demonic possession. It was the witnesses. We're talking about doctors, nurses, police officers, even a social worker. I'm only going to read snippets of it, but I want you to, to listen to this. On March 10, 2012, a woman named Campbell reported this incident, and she said the family's uneasy is beginning to turn into fear. It was about 2 a.m. Normally, Campbell, Amons, Amons is her mother, and her children would have been asleep. But they were mourning the death of a loved one with a group of friends. Amons, that's the grandmother, who was in Campbell's bedroom, started everyone, heard everyone screaming. Campbell said she ran to the bedroom where her 12-year-old granddaughter and a friend were staying. Amos and Campbell said the 12-year-old was levitating above the bed, unconscious. According to the accounts of events, Amons and several others surrounded the girl, started praying. Eventually, Campbell said, her granddaughter descended onto the bed. The girl woke up with no memory of what happened. Campbell and Amos called the local church looking for help in what they believed was something supernatural. 
but most refused to listen. Eventually, after listening to Camel and Amos talk about the house and visiting it, officials at one church told them that the Carolina house had spirits in it. They recommended the family clean the home with bleach and ammonia, then use oil to draw crosses on every door and window. Right away, you know these people are not Christians, but let's go on. Campbell and Amos, and Amos also told the Star magazine, they reached out to two clairvoyants who said the house was besieged by more than 200 demons. The explanation made sense to Campbell, and, and she said because it messed with their Christian faith. Not necessarily, but we'll go on. The family said demons possess Amos and her children, then ages 7, 9, and 12. The kids' eyes were bulged. They, they would have these evil smiles across their faces, and their voices deepened every time it happened. Finally, in desperation, they went to their family physician on April 19, 2012. Amos said she was told that they were going through something natural. The doctor then witnessed an event that they, he told the star was bizarre. He went on to say, 20 years, I've never heard anything like this in my life. I was scared myself when I walked into the room. Well, what did he see? What Amos and Camo said happened next almost was, was also detailed in the Department of Children's Services report. So DHS is, DAH is there, the Department of Children's Services, DCS. They're there. Camo says that her son cursed the doctor in a demonic voice, raged at him. Medical staff said the young boy was then lifted and thrown into the wall with no one touching him. The, DC, the DCS report documented this event, and it came up, by the way, during a trial. DCS family case manager Valerie Washington was able to handle the initial investigation. She interviewed the family in the hospital. While she spoke with Amos, the seven-year-old boy started growling with his teeth. His eyes rolled into the back of his head. The boy locked his hands around his brother's throat and refused to let go until adults were able to pry his hands away. Later that evening, this is the social worker. The social worker and a registered nurse named Willie Lee Walker brought two boys into a small examination room for interview. Campbell then joined the two boys. These are her two sons. The seven-year-old stared into his brother's eyes and began growling again. It's time to die, the boy said in a deep voice, a natural voice. I will kill you. While the youngest boy spoke, the older brother started headbutting Campbell in the stomach. Campbell grabbed his grandson's hand and started praying. What happened next would rattle the witnesses, and to some it would, not, it would offer not only evidence but proof of paranormal activity. According to Washington's original Department of Child Services report and, and an account collaborated by the nurse, Ms. Uh, Walker, the nine-year-old boy had a weird grin, walked backwards up a wall to the ceiling, and then he flipped over, holding onto Campbell's hand, never letting go. I'm going to stop there. You know, when we read stories like this, we can recognize, hey, this is demonic possession. This is, this is demonic. And we have to thank Hollywood for that because Hollywood promotes certain activities that way. He does. And it reached the point now where society does not recognize demonic possession unless we see activities like this going on. Are you still with me? Go to Mark chapter 1, please. Mark chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse number 21. Then they, when they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. This is Christ Jesus. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. Now there was a man in the synagogue who, who with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. 
And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned even among themselves, saying, Who is this? And what new doctrine this is? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region and around Galilee. Okay, stop there. Church, we're familiar with the account of the guy in Luke chapter 4, I believe, who was possessed by legions. He was obsessed with nudity, right? Stripped off his clothes, walked around naked, slept in the tombs. He was obsessed with dead things, with dead people. He slept in the tombs. He had supernatural strength. He broke the chains that they would bind him with. Every time they bound them in chains, he broke them with his bare hands. He had supernatural strength. In this account here, Jesus goes into the synagogue. That's like, you know, going into church. And there's a man sitting there, demonically possessed. Sitting there, listening to the word of God. Did he demonstrate anything unusual? No. Did he try to rip off his clothes while he was there? No. What did he do? He just sat there and listened to the word of God. You see, we cannot afford to not be able to identify the footprints of Satan. He operates under radar most of the time. Well, my time is up. My encouragement to each of you, church, stay on guard. Stay in your Bible. Listen to the word of God and beware of the leaven of Satan. He that has ears to hear Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let's all stand. If you'd like to hear more about this, um, the next time I get to teach, I'm not sure if it'll be next Wednesday, there's a continuation to this, this lesson where I get more into the activities of these strange spirits, these demonic spirits. And if you really, if you're interested in that, take a look at Daniel chapter 7 very carefully. Daniel provides some great insight. But for us today, the Lord commands us that we should tarry, carry on with our work until he comes. Let's do just that. Our mission, our objective is to open our mouths with boldness and declare the goodness of Jesus Christ, what he has done for each of us in our lives. And let us not forget that. Just as long as we're here on this earth, that's our mission. And I know some of you are thinking, gee, that's not me, I can't go out there, I'm not comfortable doing that. You know, you speak more with your actions than you do with your words. Fine, if you are not that person to speak the words out to someone's strength, just show them by being the, the, the person God has called you to be. You know, sometimes you might be the only Bible someone read. That's my encouragement to each of you. Let's pray together. Our oh, gracious, most holy Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here to hear from you. And Father, I pray that you will please grant each of us the understanding of the things that you have proclaimed to us today and let it grow, Father, fruit that is worthy of repentance. Father, I ask your blessings upon each soul who's here right now and those who are watching remotely. I pray, Father, in your mercy, you will please keep us all physically safe from harm, Father, and especially safe from spiritual harm. I pray, Father, in your mercy, you will allow us to assemble again in honor of your holy and sacred name. We pray right now, Father, for Pastor Dave, asking a blessing upon him for healing, and we pray for Pastor Reggie right now, who's about ready to go through a procedure. We're asking, Father, that in your mercy, you will send your spirit ahead Prepare the way, Father, for a good procedure for Reggie. We pray you will relieve him of the pain he's experiencing right now. And Father, I want to lift up right now everyone who is suffering from something. There's more people among us, Father, who are suffering from, from pain, physical pain, even emotional pain. Father, please, I pray in your mercy, touch them right now. Provide them healing, provide them relief. Give each one of them, Father, a new testimony of how the great I am has provided healing. 
Father, we want to thank you once again, and we just praise you in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. We pray these things in his name. Amen. 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 Be safe, everyone.